Hello, everybody. Welcome back to our Meet the Professor series with Tomorrow's Podiatry. Today, we are sat with Professor Mike Edmonds for a live Q&A session. If you caught last week's episode, you'll know exactly how Professor Edmonds has been a strong ally of podiatry. If you missed it, be sure to check it out as the episode is now available on Tomorrow's Podiatry Facebook page as well as my YouTube channel. In this week's episode, we are treated by a live lecture from Professor Edmonds. Thank you so much for joining us today, Professor Edmonds, and being a part of this incredibly insightful series. How are you doing? Great. Yeah, looking forward to the meeting uh, and to the lecture <laughs> uh, tonight. As are we. What do you have in store for us today? Sorry, what did I have? What do you have in store for us today? Oh, uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about the the role of the multidisciplinary clinic and particularly uh, stressing uh, the role of the podiatrist in the overall aim to reduce uh, avoidable lower limb amputations. That's fantastic. Shall we get started? Sure thing. Awesome. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, as I said, uh, I'm, I'm going to look at ways of reducing avoidable lower limb amputations uh, the role of the multidisciplinary diabetic foot clinic. So good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for tuning in. And uh, I look forward to the lecture and also uh, some discussion, hopefully. Uh, so major amputation, one of the most feared complications of diabetes. And every 20 seconds in the world, someone loses a leg due to diabetes. So in 2021, this is still occurring and it really is not acceptable and we say this so often every 20 seconds and i think partly it's lost its impact and this uh, issue of amputation is obviously universal so how can we reduce avoidable amputations we've got to understand the natural history of the diabetic foot and the role of the multidisciplinary, sometimes called interdisciplinary diabetic foot clinic. And uh, tonight I'm going to refer partly to our experience in the diabetic foot clinic at King's College Hospital, which uh, is celebrating its 40th anniversary this year. So two basic divisions, neuropathic foot and ischemic foot. Then these can be subdivided into the neuropathic ulcerated foot and to the Charcot foot, that's the neuropathic foot. And the ischemic foot can be subdivided into the neuroischemic foot, mild or moderate ischemia with neuropathy, critically ischemic foot, severe ischemia, acutely ischemic foot, overwhelming sudden ischemia, and perhaps a subdivision we call renal ischemic foot. Uh, where the, the schema is very characteristic in its presentation within the background of renal. We look at these divisions uh, through a simple staging system and we go from normal, high risk, ulcerated, infected to necrotic. So these are the stages. And uh, let me explain this further. And this is a panorama of what we feel is happening in the diabetic world. We've got a high risk neuropathic foot and this develops an ulcer on the plantar surface. 50% get infected. You can see the cellulitis and this leads to infective necrosis. And delay at treating at stage three, four and five can lead to amputation. Neuropathic foot may also be susceptible to Charcot foot, bone and joint problems and it presents with a marked inflammation, the hot swollen foot. If this foot is not immobilized, offloaded, it will become deformed, ulcerated, and infected. And again, this will lead to infective necrosis. So delay at stage three, four, and five results can result in amputation. Let's go now to the ischemic foot, the neuro ischemic foot. Uh, you can see here uh, edema, uh, on the uh, dorsal of the foot from associated cardiac failure. And we've got the neuroischemic foot leading to ulceration and this leading to cellulitis and again an infective necrosis. So here is the driver. 
um, these slides are going on <laughs> at the road speed, which is very si significant of a, of a diabetic foot problem. Uh, and then we've got the critically ischemic foot, severe ischemia leads to tissue ischemia and gangrene. Here the driver is ischemia. In the neuro ischemic foot, it's infection. And let's now go on to the acutely ischemic foot. Uh, sudden overwhelming ischemia, cyanosis, blue foot, uh, mottled foot, fixed mottling, death of the tissue. And finally, the renal ischemic foot, uh, which is associated initially with small necrotic areas, often precipitated by minor trauma. It produces an inflammatory reaction. It leads to further areas of necrosis and finally quite involving the foot. And we call, because of this progression to necrosis, we call these um, issues, for these progressions, uh, foot attack, rather similar to the heart attack and the stroke or, or, or brain attack, because it's a progression to uh, necrosis. And, and it's basically a situation of chaos. Uh, and this is happening uh, throughout the world. It's happening in UK tonight. Uh, this is going on, this natural history. And the podiatrist has a very important role in intervening to uh, control this chaos. So what is the solution? Well, we've got to restore control to prevent this progression to necrosis. We've got to get control of the wound, of mechanical factors, of vascular factors, infection control, metabolic control, and educational control. And as I mentioned last week in 1981, we set up a multidisciplinary foot clinic uh, to try and basically bring these controlling features in. And we were able to reduce the uh, major amputation rate by approximately 50%, uh, as you can see here, with the foot service starting in 81. And these involve both neuropathic amputations and ischemic amputations. This was taken on uh, at the St. Vincent Declaration, which is a meet was a meeting between the WHO, International Diabetes Federation, European governments, patient organizations, meeting at a tiny little village at St. Vincent in northern Italy in 1989. And it set about trying to improve the outlook for patients with diabetes. And it made the St. Vincent Declaration recommendations to improve diabetic care reduced by 50% the rate of limb amputations for diabetic gangrene, as we had uh, demonstrated, reduced new blindness by a third, reduced people entering into end-stage renal failure by a third. So this set the scene. Um, it was a great idea, a lot of excitement initially, uh, but uh, the initial targets, European-wide and worldwide, were, were, were not met. But what has remained has been a multidisciplinary diabetic foot clinic. And recently, uh, there have been two um, systematic reviews, uh, one by Albright, which concluded healthcare systems can expect a 39 to 56% amputation rate after implementing a multidisciplinary amputation preventing program. And a further one by Mazuza in a systematic review of uh, multidisciplinary teams, major amputation, as the Asians were reduced in 94% of the studies. And the multidisciplinary foot clinic has been endorsed by the International Working Group on the Diabetic Foot at its meeting in 1999 and subsequently the Society for Vascular Surgery and the American Podiatric Medical Association in America and the Global Vascular Guidelines published uh, on chronic limb threatening ischemia in 2019. So let's just look at a little more deeply at the multidisciplinary diabetic foot clinic. What are the important features that are crucial to the reduction of amputations? Well, three points I want to make. First, you've got to have a focus of care, a physical, as it were, operations center for a particular area where patients can come and, and where the uh, resources are, are located. And to that, there must be good access to care, rapid access to care in a patient-friendly pathway. And the team must uh, preach and practice coordinated and integrated care.
And, and just as a demonstration of this, this is our weekly uh, timetable in the uh, Diabetic uh, Foot Clinic uh, at King's. Um, I won't go through it all, but you can see uh, there's an SOS, an emergency clinic, uh, available each day for, for these pa emergency patients. And then, okay, on the Monday, we've got joint diabetic orthopedic plastic surgery. So a lot of joint clinics, a lot of joint working uh, on the Monday morning going down. This carries on for the afternoon, uh, but there's also then a ward round. On Tuesday, we switch off over to the vascular side and have a joint diabetic foot vascular clinic and ward round. We also need time for treating uh, ulcers in the clinic. Uh, let me say that all these, the, the, this clinic essentially uh, belongs to the podiatrist. Podiatrist is the gatekeeper of this clinic uh, and is a major uh, player in all these clinics. Uh, uh, and particularly with the uh, pushing the ulcer clinic itself and then there's an MDT on the on, on, on the board. Wednesday we've got a Charcot clinic moving along, uh, a vascular radiology MDT where we discuss the angiograms uh, of both diabetic and non-diabetic. We carry on Wednesday afternoon with a Charcot clinic. Uh, on Thursday uh, we again have a joint diabetic foot vascular clinic and ward round and also clinic and an ulcer clinic in the afternoon with a, a ward round and then Friday again a joint diabetic foot vascular clinic and ulcer clinic so uh, 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 joint clinics uh, are, are a feature uh, as well as clinics where the podiatrist is uh, as it were alone and treating the ulcer clinic uh, themselves and, and we use a lot of uh, total contact casts uh, which is the safe treatment uh, for a neuropathic foot ulcer. Uh, as I mentioned last week I think uh, the, the, the foot clinic, uh, the, uh, they are carried out by our podiatrist, um, Ali Foster uh, learned the technique from Paul Brand in the, when he was in Louisiana having come from his India uh, missionary work uh, to, to, to Louisiana where he was treating uh, pay, actually uh, people with leprosy, leprosarium uh, in Carville in uh, Lucy, Louisiana. Uh, it's, oft, it's not widely used the total contact cost, uh, pe uh, because of possible uh, problems but when, when we look at the retrospective study here, look on the left here, 106 cases, uh, we were particularly looking for complications but uh, what were the indications? When you go to the second column along, 18 neuropathic ulcer, 56 Charcot joint, 32 Charcot with an ulcer. And we looked at tissue injuries, uh, cast complications, structural complications, and they were all pretty minor. Uh, two very superficial ulcers, three abrasions, one cast allergy, one cast leak, one cast crack, one cast pain. All the complications uh, were resolved quickly and casting therapy was continued. So we only had minor problems in 5.7% of the cases. You've got to have a system. You've got to, people with diabetes have got to be well uh, educated uh, in looking after their cast and being aware of complications. And they've got to feel confident that they can come to the clinic in mainly working hours or uh, go to, to casualty with information uh, if uh, they, they have a problem with their cast. Uh, but really, very few uh, cast related injuries and to stress again the casting service in our foot clinic is totally run uh, managed by the podiatrists so overall to this clinic we need uh, open access service to see emergency cases referrals from healthcare professionals gps community nurses community practitioners, and patients and it is the podiatrist who will see them first uh, and, and make the initial uh, assessment and diagnosis. And then if it's an emergency situation, we'll bring in other um, disciplines or uh, podiatrists may be able to treat themselves. There's now in a very extended role of podiatrists. Uh, uh, if, if we need the expert care of the vascular or orthopedic or plastic surgery people, then the patient will either be directed to the clinic, uh, the uh, joint clinic as such, um, um, at, at the appropriate uh, time. Access is, is, is very good. And, and this is just to show um, a patient who had noticed uh, a discoloration of the toe 
woke up with a discoloration of, of the toe. It was going blue, as you can see. Uh, there was some exudate in the uh, the, the, the nail fold, uh, and, and he, he he did see this and and, and was concerned. Uh, he uh, um, spoke actually, he was being visited by his district nurse, he phoned up district nurse and the district nurse said, uh, we've got to come uh, to a foot clinic. Uh, there we are, we see the, the blue discoloration. And what could this be due to? Um, it was obviously lacking oxygen to the skin, could be ischemia, but could be infection with that exudate. Uh, we saw him in the clinic, uh, we thought it was infection. Uh, treated with uh, aggressively with antibiotics and you can see within two three days uh, the color of the skin had recovered uh, and, and the hypoxia had, had been resolved so this is the ideal of a quick access uh, and rapid treatment but delay is common uh, European studies have been carried out and also applies to UK uh, diagnosis is often delayed more than three weeks from the onset of the wound and there is limited understanding and knowledge of both patients and healthcare professionals. And now I'm going to go on to the, what was in the second column because delay here is very important. This is a Charcot foot. Um, it occurred in a 23-year-old lady, uh, type 1, who had just tripped over her dog a few weeks uh, earlier and you can see the hind foot deformity. So what's going on in a Charcot foot? Uh, well, the, the truthful answer is we don't fully understand it. But from a panoramic view, there's an initial trauma which leads to a primary injury. This leads to uncontrolled inflammation. It's uncontrolled because there is a concomitant neuropathy and you need your nerves to control your inflammation, to switch it on, and switch it off. Look, if you have a neuropathy, you tend to get uncontrolled inflammation with a lot of inflammatory cytokines. And of course, secondary trauma occurs, the patient has a neuropathy, it may have a, a numb foot, but will continue walking. Uh, and that can lead to uncontrolled inflammation. So we have an acute active Charcot foot, often called acute Charcot foot, we would prefer to call active. What is the active Charcot foot? Well, it's inflammation of the foot associated with non-specific combinations of damage to bones, joints, soft tissues, uh, and it's important initial stage in the natural history, and which is shown here. And from this initial stage, there are two main pathways which can take the foot to amputation. On the left, I've showed you before, the development of deformity, ulceration, swelling, and an infective necrosis. But also on the right, you can develop deformity which becomes extremely severe and uh, it, it, it's not possible to walk on that limb uh, and therefore unless it's reconstructed that limb uh, the patient is heading for an amputation let's just remember that this pathway can proceed very rapidly and it was Charcot himself who said he was describing uh, joint, Charcot joints, not in diabetes, but in syphilis, tabes torsalis. And overnight, there is the enormous tumefaction of a member. And one or two weeks later, sometimes much sooner, the existence of more or less marked cracking signs may be noted, betraying the alteration of the articular surfaces, which at this period is already profound. So very rapid destruction. And we see scenarios like this, a patient tripped in the ice in winter, comes to casualty, x-ray is basically okay. Uh, no mention of diabetes as such. Uh, the patient uh, is, is, is reassured, goes home, and six weeks later has disruption of the hind foot, as you can see here. Also, Midfoot problems also occur. This is the x-ray at presentation of a patient who presented with a hot swollen foot to a casualty department. Uh, if you actually look uh, at the base of the first and second metatarsal, there's an increased distance there. Uh, but the patient went home, continued walking, and 10 days later, you can see this marked separation of the bases and a, a, a Lisfranca dislocation of the midfoot. 
and these lead to the de deformities and this is what we call a medial convexity deformity uh, as you can see here and this is because of disruption and dislocation in the uh, tarsal bones with extrusion of the medial cuneiform here uh, and also involvement of the uh, other cuneiforms uh, so this and this is the classical rocker bottom deformity uh, which can develop now at these stages in the late presentation it's easy for you to make a diagnosis of charcoal you've just got to get on and treat it but uh, let me just take you back to the initial stages at the top line here the hot swollen foot the stage naught the hot red swollen foot where it's so important to make a diagnosis here and uh, a hot red swollen foot should be considered a shark and foot and to prove otherwise so how do we prove otherwise or not what is the approach well there have been three advances in management of the shark and foot uh, and the podiatrist is very very important particularly in stage one uh, and also it's, 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 it helps in, in two and three. Uh, but one is early diagnosis to prevent deformity. And, and, and this is the modern approach. Diagnose the shark of foot when the x-ray is normal and with rapid intervention, keep it normal. So often the x-ray may be normal when, you, when the patient presents. So then you've got to go to a modern imaging. You've got to go to MRI or to spec CT which stands for single photon emission computed tomosintography uh, and computed tomography. I mean, that's a very complicated name, but essentially it's a 3D bone scan uh, with a 3D x-ray, which is a CT. And I'll show you an example. Or you may just do uh, CT itself. This is a, an MRI, and you can see here on the T1 that there is a fracture line on the medial cuneiform and this is associated on the stir with uh, edema in this medial cuneiform and on the post gallinium which shows up inflammation you can see the inflammatory response so this is one of the early signs of a charco and the podiatrist puts that patient in a cast and we repeat the mri six weeks later and you can see nearly healing of the medial cuneiform a resolution of the edema and near resolution of the inflammation on the post gadolinium and the MRI may pick up various permutations of, of, of changes this is the spec CT uh, machine there is a gamma camera which rotates around the the foot to do to give a 3d bone scan and an x-ray machine which rotates to give the CT so uh, this is um, a picture we, we we basically get a bone scan which actually is showing increased activity in the left hind foot you can see this increased activity now we know when we know that we do the ct scan directed at the hind foot so this is a ct scan and this is the hot spot superimposed upon it so why why is this a hot spot the hot spot means that uh, it's the uh, osteoblasts are taking up the tracer osteoblasts are rushing in to heal something what are they trying to, what are they healing but if you have a closer look at that uh, talus you can see a fracture line here uh, and that's what is uh, the, the, the source of the hot spot and it's very important not to miss this because continued walking may lead to uh, a marked increase in that fracture and then possible disruption of the hind foot so uh, early diagnosis can be there with just the CT uh, and CT alone uh, if you can't do a spec CT then maybe CT itself alone will give you some information let's just go back to that deformity that you we saw uh, in, the, in the natural history here is the deformity and now this is uh, also a, a modern advance in charco foot care and this is the reconstruction and uh, this is uh, carried out mainly by orthopedic surgeons or, or i guess podiatric surgeons could also uh, be involved um, it, it's 
it, it's a late presentation challenge for the whole team and, and that, that team includes the podiatrist mm -hmm. uh, because you may well be there at the initial uh, diagnosis and you'll be certainly there in the post-operative state uh, and, and also directing assessment of the foot we've noticed now with the long-standing presentation of Charcot that uh, the patient's may have some ischemia. Now, that sounds counterintuitive. You know, the classical teaching for the Charcot foot has been a hot, red, swollen, bounding pulses foot. But uh, well, that is still the case. But if patients present later, they may well have developed some ischemia. And, and this is an outline of the, uh, of the result of um, a, a duplex scan. And you can see this patient had blockage of his superficial femoral artery and also of his posterior tibial artery. And because this is such a big operation, you need extremely good blood supply. So the patient needed a bypass of this area. So he needed a fem bypass to, uh, to, to avoid this area and then uh, it was thought that the anterior tibial here uh, was good and the patient could run on uh, on that so that was done patient had reconstruction uh, with the, the plating and and, and the rod uh, and that brought the foot into well, a much better alignment and was plantigrade but there was uh, difficulty in closing the wound so this is one post-operative problem how are we going to get that wound healed? Uh, and there was another problem that the anterior tibial, which uh, he'd been surviving on, uh, was in fact not getting down uh, to the foot. So the patient needed a further bypass uh, from the original bypass, getting blood down into uh, the foot. Uh, so that had to be done. And then that vascular construction improved the perfusion but th this is where the foot clinic and the podiatrist now comes into their own uh, because you've got to coordinate the healing of that wound and uh, we use a lot of negative pressure therapy for large wounds in the foot clinic uh, beautifully and skillfully uh, applied by uh, podiatrists in, in the clinic uh, getting a good granulation tissue and then getting some assistance from plastic uh, surgery uh, uh, people who come also come to the clinic with a grafting uh, and then a healing so we end up ended up with a normally aligned plantar grade foot but you can imagine that's a whole team effort and after discharge from the patient uh, from the hospital the patient is followed up in the multidisciplinary foot clinic where the podiatrist as it were again is the, is, is, is the gatekeeper and the basic person in charge i've mentioned vascular problems uh, within the context of the shako foot uh, I, I will now mention vascular problems of their own accord and we're now moving if you go back and remember that panoramic view uh, we've got the neuro ischemic critical ischemic acute ischemic foot so we want um, quick assessment first appointment is a one-stop shop uh, neuro ischemic foot we, we can probably see within seven days if it's felt to be critically ischemic within 24 to 72 hours of course if it's acutely ischemic then it's got to be seen straight away and will need immediate treatment uh, when the patient comes to the clinic same day vascular studies uh, duplex sonography to determine the extent of disease and then let's make a decision can we on the duplex data decide whether that patient needs conservative treatment uh, angioplast uh, balloon dilatation or bypass surgery uh, the patient, if it's iliac disease, may need further investigation, such as a CT angiogram. But that procedure then takes place, and the post-surgery joint care and surveillance again takes place in the multidisciplinary foot clinic. Just a point on the uh, imaging for you to be aware, um, which comes before the interventional radiology and bypass. Uh, 
duplex sonography. Uh, we have access to an excellent uh, vascular laboratory. Uh, is the uh, mainstay now uh, non-invasive um, treatment uh, assessment. Uh, and you can see here uh, the good systolic flow uh, in the right posterior tibial artery, uh, the systole and diastole. Good flow in the posterior tibial artery above the ankle, but then you go below the ankle and look at the vessel. You can see some calcification here, and you can see that the the waveform is much diminished here. The systolic flow is very damped. It's called monophasic flow. So this indicates a, a reduction in the distal PTA. Uh, and, th and this was because um, if you look at this angiogram, you have got the posterior tibial uh, coming there, but cutting, uh, but, but cutting off. And uh, then uh, we then uh, put the angioplasty balloon down and that's recovered blood supply uh, to the posterior part of the foot where well, the posterior tibial then goes on to the plantar aspect of the foot and restores the sonogram basically and there is improved flow uh, in the PTA uh, as well. Uh, other maneuvers by the, the, the the point I want to make is that the uh, the radiologist now can go very distal into uh, the circulation because that's where the, the main problem is in a, a person with diabetes. Here uh, you've got a good uh, anterior tibial uh, and some degree of an arch, but the posterior tibial here is diminished as such, uh, and the it's re, it's restored by pushing a wire down to the anterior tibial uh, through the arch and putting a balloon in the uh, lower part, uh, well, it, it, it's actually the, the plantar artery here, uh, and then the wire goes up the posterior tibial and the uh, stenosis can be relieved and full perfusion uh, obtained. So that's retrogade recanalization uh, going upwards uh, from the foot to the leg of the distal PTA. And uh, sometimes it's necessary uh, when, when there's a problem in the leg with the, the anterior tibial here that the radiologist can put a direct puncture in of the anterior tibial and put a wire up the anterior tibial and then a balloon, blow the balloon up and restore uh, the anterior tibial artery. And, and finally, uh, again, going back to the foot, uh, you may have an anterior tibial and a dorsalis pedis, but a lack of an arch uh, and lack of, of plantar arteries here. So the wire goes down, uh, gets through the arch, and then a balloon can also be thread over that wire and dilated up, and then that can restore uh, the arch uh, and the posterior tibial. So these are all uh, maneuvers which can be done uh, in uh, in the uh, angiology room uh, under local anaesthetic so they really can be carried out uh, in quite frail elderly patients uh, and just to show you another example this was a patient quite a younger patient actually who had a necrosis difficult to heal necrosis of her, her first toe uh, and when we looked at the uh, circulation, uh, there was a problem in the metatarsal artery. You can see the calcification here uh, in, in the metatarsal artery. Uh, and, and then you can see, in fact, lack of blood supply coming down into these metatarsal arteries. So a wire was put down um, and then a balloon over this first metatarsal artery. There's the wire, there's the balloon that's blown up and then uh, when that's taken out and uh, an injection of dye given, you can see that there is a return of blood flow in the first metatarsal artery. Uh, that's the balloon dilatation and that's the uh, metatarsal artery you see going into the medial side of the first, uh, well, yeah, medial side of the first metatarsal artery. So um, the message is that even the very small arteries can be uh, di dilated and that can lead to healing. The wound care 
game within the context of this very uh, skillful uh, debridement uh, of loading is within the jurisdiction of the podiatrist. So this is the diabetic foot clinic uh, and the various maneuvers that are going on. Uh, if I start you here at about 11 o'clock, uh, we've got wound care, orthotics and plasters. So the plasters are led by the podiatrists and also the wound care with some nursing help. We do have an orthotist adjacent to the clinic who will also come in. Emergency referrals going down are seen first by uh, the podiatrist um, uh, and then a decision made as to whether there needs to be other further disciplines involved. Uh, the joint vascular diabetic clinics, the joint orthopedic diabetic clinics. The podiatrist also is the gatekeeper of the patients here, uh, is the follower and uh, is uh, just a, 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 an important member of the team when people are being discussed. Um, there's an outpatient antibiotic service which is run by uh, our, our nurse uh, to give IVs when necessary. Debridement and minor surgery. Debridement obviously is a main feature of podiatry and uh, we're working now to a minor surgical theatre which uh, is, is, is up uh, and this will also be um, worked in by the, the podiatrist. All post-operative reviews, uh, vascular, or diabetic, orthopedic, diabetic of the foot come through the diabetic foot clinic and again with the podiatrist uh, as a gatekeeper to that charco foot clinics early diagnosis important and the standard treatment of course is the total contact cast for the early stages and of course education and research and the whole coordination of primary and secondary care so uh, up until recently uh, the diabetic foot has defeated really every healthcare system in the world. Uh, but advances in our understanding have led to improvements in care. And we are now seeing uh, that ulcers can be healed quickly and therefore by amputations uh, prevented. And I hope I've shown that throughout this whole um, procedure uh, and program, uh, the role of the podiatrist is paramount so thank you for listening um, for this for it's about 35 36 minutes so uh, all of you who are still there um, I'm very grateful and I am happy to ask any questions if you so wish that was such an amazing uh, lecture <laughs> uh, let me just start off by saying um, when you said situation of chaos, like right right at the very beginning, and you said how podiatrists control that chaos, I thought that was a pretty amazing way of phrasing um, our profession and just exactly what we're dealing with. Um, so yeah. that's that's pretty brilliant. <laughs> well, I, we, I, 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 I think I wanted to make it you know clear that we, we do have these aggressive natural histories, mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's why we're having all these amputations. Uh, and we've got to intervene in these natural histories. And I think the podiatrist is very well educated and equipped and skilled to be one of the, well, the leader, one of the leaders in this attempt to control uh, this, this, this chaos. Mm. Yeah, that's uh yeah. I, I I completely agree. We do have a couple questions which I think you'll you'll enjoy. Um, so the first one is from <laughs> from Andrea Milne. I hope I'm saying that right. Um, she asks, I thought you couldn't stent uh, in foot as arteries are too small. What are your thoughts on that? The foot arteries are too small. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, this this is a very important topic. Uh, and it, 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 it's relative, it, it, it's relative in the sense that over the last five, so eight years, 
techniques have been developed to approach these small ulcers, small vessels in the foot. Uh, for example, uh, in the angioplasty initially, uh, coronary artery catheters were used because in, uh, on the heart, the arteries are also small as you go down into the distal part of the arteries. Uh, so uh, there's been, a, as it were, an extrapolation. Uh, but people have become very skilled in approaching the vessels below the foot. Um, historically, uh, and one's, one's seen this, initially, uh, you know, the, the frontier was uh, the knee and nobody would go below the knee. And then gradually people, um, surgeons and radiologists went below the knee and looked at and treated the, what we call the crural vessels, the anterior tip, posterior tip and the perineal. Now the, it's a new frontier and that frontier is the ankle and uh, techniques have been developed as I showed you tonight with improving the, the, the planter, the planter loop as such. And, and it's necessary because diabetes is characterized by particularly distal disease. And you can remember this uh, by the, this sort of, this aphorism in, in the sense that in non-diabetes, atherosclerosis goes from the nose to the toes. In diabetes, atherosclerosis goes from the toes up to the nose. So it's a big problem in the feet. Uh, now, you may be, there's one other point. There are some writings and uh, which, which actually says the dorsalis pedis is spared in the, in, in the foot. And in some cases it is. But um, in, in, in many cases now we do see involvement of, of the dorsalis pedis. So I, I think it's difficult because some vascular surgeons are very good at this and are, are really keen to do this and, and perhaps others don't have the same experience uh, in dealing with this. But now with the rejigging of the vascular services in the sense that there are spoke hospitals and, and a hub hospital. Uh, there should be some expertise in the hub hospital to deal with this uh, distal disease. Mm. Andrea, I hope that answers your question. That's a really great question. Um, and Professor Edmonds, you have, you've answered that beautifully. Um, the next question we have is from Rob Menzies. He says, he asks, are you doing anything to investigate the pedal acceleration time pre and post intervention of the medial and lateral plantar and arcuate arteries? <laughs> that's quite a <laughs> mouthful of a question, but yes. Well, that's, that's a good point. And, uh, we, not as such at the moment, but maybe I can answer it in a, a general situation that our vascular scientists uh, are looking very hard in the foot arteries. And, and that's been a revolution, really. Uh, and, and that also has been promoted by uh, new techniques and new new equipment so that they've got the right probes to look at these small arteries. Uh, I know that this, um, the technique that you've, you've described uh, is um, being used and uh, has been particularly put forward in Canada. And I know, I think uh, the, the um, Joe Mills is also using it in America and looking at it. I mean, it's one way, uh, to look at these distal arteries. Uh, but, 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 but we also get really good uh, reports and uh, pictures, uh, like I've showed you today. Well, well, what I've showed you today is the posterior tibial artery, but we can get similar uh, pictures, um, sonograms from the, the plantar arteries as well. So uh, that often gives us um, a, a good view and uh, we are very fortunate to have a very um, superb aggressive uh, vascular surgeons 
who will you know, put bypasses on to the plantar arteries, and even the metatarsal arteries, I think they've done one. And, you know, and even they will do it under local anesthetic. So th th they are, you know, they are fantastic. And uh, we obviously have to support them with the uh, uh, appropriate imaging. Uh, but it's all it's all changing really you see we, there's been several revolutions the, the 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 frontier has gone down from from the knee to the ankle not only in the imaging techniques but also in the intervention techniques and and this i i, I, I and we're seeing more distal disease because it's associated uh, with the renal foot so I, that's why I made an extra scenario of the renal foot because it's associated particularly with severe distal disease. And one word I haven't mentioned tonight, which is also another problem, and that is the severe calcification that occurs in the arteries. But you know, I, 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 I stress this and I mentioned these new techniques, but you can have these new techniques and, uh, and again, also the technique of, of, of reconstructing the Charcot foot, but you need a good team backup and you need uh, good wound care um, in the foot, which is, you know, par excellence, portrayed by our podiatrists uh, and uh, you know, I think it's fair, fair to say and he won't mind saying you are our orthopedic surgeon uh, when he set about this program he was not really too concerned uh, about the difficulty in the actual surgical reconstruction he, he was more worried will I get these old, uh, the wounds healed after surgery uh, he was also worried about the medical you know, situation of these patients. But you know, the, the team reassured him that we will follow patients in the foot clinic and we will do our best with him to get these wounds healed. So it's a team. And, and, and that was holding things back, essentially. Uh, and, and I think that's a situation perhaps in some other areas where the orthopedic surgeon might be keen, uh, but you know the, the team must be there uh, to support but it's all when i say support it's not a it's not the junior part but every every member of the team is important uh, and i think you know that's uh, i've strayed away a little bit from the answer uh, the question but it's all i know it's saying the obvious now but all the activity is below the ankle well not all of it but we, we've got to deal with below the ankle uh, we can't just say now oh, there's disease below the ankle, we just can't do anything about it. You know, that, mm -hmm. that we're now in 2021, and, you know, that the, 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 the small vessels of the foot are amenable. Mm. Rob, I, I hope that answers your question. And I, I completely understand where you're coming from, Professor Edmonds. You have so much knowledge and experience, and it's really hard to kind of compact that into one one question or one 30 minute presentation so if you go off on tangents we absolutely love that like as as a student i really appreciate that <laughs> and i'm sure all of, all the viewers here today they really appreciate that as well um so that's a fabulous question thanks rob um if you have any more questions please send them through we are still asking please don't be shy uh we do have a couple comments from adele holmes she says great to listen and to see the prof uh happy memories of Halcyon days with him and Ali. I don't know. I don't know what that is particularly, but I'm I'm hoping you do. Thanks, Mike. You inspired my 32 year passion in diabetic foot complications. That's lovely. Uh, you say happy memories of Ali, was it? Yeah, Adele Holmes. She says yes. happy happy memories uh, of Halcyon days. Yeah. Yes. Uh, well. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, Adela. I I I, I do also remember them and. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it always, it, it always, they, they were very good days, and we, we, I, I, I've had the great fortune in in working with uh, superb podiatrists uh, over the forty years, uh, and 
I, I, I've also had the fortune of uh, working the three podiatry managers. I've only, we've only had three podiatry managers over the 40 years, so that they've each had a long duration, and uh, plus all the other podiatrists. So it's a, it's as I mentioned last last time, it, it was primarily uh, a, a combination of, of of diabetologists and podiatrists which uh, set it off. So thank you very much, Adele, for your uh, lovely comments. So we've got another question from Rob. He said he asks, speaking of that, with all this calcification in the vessels and especially in HD patients, how important do you feel that calcium regulation slash dysregulation rank OPG pathways has a role in medial calcification and charco, especially in those who develop calcification post charco? Yeah, well, calcification is a major problem. Uh, it's, it's the classical medial artery calcification, but it's, a, I think, a little um, difficult to fully look at the, the role of it. Um, it. It starts off by being restricted to the medial wall, but then can be quite uh, proliferative uh, and can... Uh, occlude the lumen and also probably predisposes to the atherosclerotic lesion. Uh, what can we do about it? Uh, it, it certainly, as, as, as Rob mentions, uh, a lot of work has been looked at uh, certainly calcification factors uh, such as um, the osteoprodegerin and Rankel, uh, both in responsibility for the charco foot as well as their abnormalities in the medial calcification of the arteries because there seems to be a mismatch uh, you've got a lot of calcium in the arteries and lack of calcium per se in the type 1 diabetes where you do have these uh, osteoporotic uh, bones but but that's a very sort of superficial superficial link what I can say actually rob is that uh, well it, for the people with hd then uh, controlling the dialysis fluid uh, and and it seems not to be just not the calcium but also the phosphate and the link up between the two which can predispose to this calcification and controlling the phosphate in the uh, hemodialysate uh, may be a factor and uh, there is there is some work carried out go being carried out now uh there's if you want to look it up there's um professor kathy shanahan that's s-h-a-n-a-h-a-n uh is a world expert on uh calcification uh, and, and uh, both in diabetes and non-diabetes and uh, she's working with um chemists in Cambridge and uh, uh, you, you asked for treatment there's a trial going to start on the use of mi minocycline uh, which is an old-fashioned sort of antibiotic minocycline uh, it's going to be used I think mainly in the stroke environment where again in diabetes there can be a lot of calcification but certainly people believe that the, the, this calcification is a target uh, where hopefully we perhaps can control it before it becomes totally proliferative and totally obstructive. Uh, and uh, uh, these are early days, but if you, you look up uh, Google, um, uh, Catherine C, we'll see Catherine Shanahan uh, and uh, uh, minocycline, and you will, well, also you, you will get to her uh, amazing studies on, on calcification uh, to, to sort of go into that further. That's brilliant. That's a brilliant shout out. And Rob, I hope that answers your question. Thank you for your questions. Please keep them coming. Um, we've also, we've got another question from Andrea as well. Um, do you believe toe pressures are useful to record? I know big debate as to what they can tell you and significance. Yes, I do. I believe you know, toe pressure is probably more useful than an ankle pressure. And ankle pressure is artifactually raised because of this calcification problem that we've got. So uh, 
toe pressure i think is important for several reasons one the digital arteries are not so heavily calcified as the ankle arteries so you may not get such an artifactual little uh, 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 alteration uh, there uh, secondly the toe if you do an ankle pressure it doesn't tell you anything about what's going on distally in the foot so toe pressure includes what's going on in the foot as well as what's going on in the leg it gives you a, a panoramic perhaps a little more accurate view and there have been several studies to show that toe pressure is related to uh, mortality to survival particularly cardiovascular survival so when you do a toe pressure and you get it low it's also telling you that that patient has probably got severe uh, systemic disease and you should make sure you know that they are on uh, the statins and the aspirin and possibly now with the new um, compass studies uh, the anticoagulant uh, uh, rivaroxaban as a combination with aspirin uh, that's a comp compass study c-o-m-p-a-s-s study and also the voyager study these are two studies looking at the uh, combined role of the um, these, this, this, these new uh, anticoagulants they're not warfarin they, they work in some other way uh, the, 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 the new anticoagulant and they've been linked up with aspirin uh, so uh, toe pressure is a, I believe is a very important uh, measurement uh, at, which can give you an idea of what's going well it won't tell you um, specifically in the foot because obviously it reflects the whole circulation in the leg uh, but it, it, it gives you it avoids you missing problems in in the foot and it also will tell you probably what's going on in the systemic circulation hmm. awesome um andrea i hope that answers your question thank you for that comment she said i did not know that so it sounds like all her questions were answered today and she's quite happy <laughs> <laughs> before so I let you, you go, thank oh, you sorry. for the questions. <laughs> <laughs> before I let you go, though, I have one final question for you, and this is just to kind of tie in everything together that you've spoken about today, which is essentially multiple uh, multidisciplinary teams, and the underlying theme of that is teamwork, working together, and and being a cohesive unit. Yeah. I understand that working together has some structures and pillars that we stand on to make it function. Yeah. what happens and what kind of advice do you have when one of those pillars falls short in an mdt okay well um i think you you, you have to uh, address the problem uh talk to the particular discipline uh that's involved in not not in a in a positive uh, constructive way in a not in a pejorative way mm -hmm. uh, to point out that uh, we can achieve so much by working efficiently uh, together uh, and uh, perhaps bringing that discipline along it may need some modulation as such uh, but uh, in, in a sense we're all equal members of the team so you don't go in there uh, with, um, with with a sort of a, a high-minded um, uh, approach, you, you say we've got this problem with the with the foot. We really have to get um, good dis discipline working between all the modalities, and uh, I, I hopefully by approaching it in a, a positive, uh, constructive way, we can point out where the uh, deficiency or where the problem is and uh, hopefully you know get round it uh, as, as such uh, by you know enc encouraging uh, that that discipline or that person or working with that person I, I, I think it's a, a feeling of of mutual support always a mutual support uh, and understanding perhaps where there is an issue uh, and uh, working towards it actually I, I, I think 
I think that's a rather sort of a, uh, I, I think it's a sort of a, a gentle, a gentle approach. So I, I would, I would take that approach, you know, rather than the classical, you know, football approach of the hairdryer and uh, telling people <laughs> what's going wrong. So uh, I, I think that in general, over the 40 years, that sort of approach has uh, has achieved achieved the majority of its aims. Brilliant, fantastic answer. Thank you so much for joining us here tonight. Okay. Um, and thank you for taking the time to, and, and thank you for giving up your evenings to do this because this, this has been incredibly insightful and amazing. Mm. Um, keep an eye out for Nancy Keller on the Tomorrow's Podiatry Facebook page. Nancy is making a video diary of her journey on the Versus Arthritis Internship. Um, so make sure you tune into that also. Thank you for everybody joining us in here tonight. Thank you for your questions. I hope you love them. I hope you love the series. We're working so hard to make this amazing for you. Um, and we'll see you next Tuesday at 8 p.m. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.